we're here in the London studio. Tom and Luke Stockman. Look, and we were talking about we're trying to get it to happen yeah. a few years ago. I've aged over the last two years considerably. So <laughs> if it was good. Oh, cheers, mate. Uh, Thanks well, for at least you're not grey like this guy over oh, here. Geez, we were saying Straight you, away digging yeah, me out. That's, that's what we've got to do. We've just got to pull a leveller here, <laughs> haven't we? With the world's strongest men, yeah. it's called. But we've been trying a while, haven't we? Me and yeah. Luke were going back and forth first, trying to make it happen a couple of years ago. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Then Tom followed me and we're like, right, we're doing it. And it's Tom the boss, because like, once he says we're doing it, so we're I, here now. I, I make things happen. Eh? So. <laughs> I make things happen. If Tom's happy with things, then it's usually a lot easier. Yeah. Um, Tom doesn't get... No, I think it's... Yeah, if you're happy with things, then, then we know it's a good fit. And, yeah. and thankfully, Tom's happy to, to do this. He got, might he might not be happy by the end of it. Yeah, know. we'll see where we go. We've got the rubber stamp. What Are you happy being in London? Because I know what it's like as a big man trying to knock about <laughs> this mean, crazy city. Tube, let's just not talk about that. Getting in and out of taxis all the time. I'm in the taxis all the time here, but... Uh, London's busy, very, very busy. It's like 100 miles per hour. Like, you know, you, this morning I woke up at, what, 5 a.m. You look out the window, it's like rush hour. You know, back home in Highlands, you can see one car in the road. So. And a cow. Yeah, and a cow, yeah. I mean, rush hour compared to the Highlands. Yeah, every single hour here is rush hour. But it's, uh, I mean, it's nice coming down for a few days and going home. Like, mm. I love, the you know, the Trafalgar Square, seeing all the sightseeing, but... This life is not for me. I need that private, quiet life, the cold water, the gym, just not, 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 I want a private life. I don't, London's not for me. Because I, I think it's part of it being big men, and I can say that, like yeah. I'm six foot nine. Yeah. Uh, I was going to say in heels, but I am actually six foot nine. I've worn my baggy clothes today, like I was saying, just so I can <laughs> fill out, like fill out a little bit, fill out the studio. But life isn't built for big men, is it? And like London, it almost like puts a microscope on that. Like we mentioned getting around, Luke, what are you like? Are you like on tubes and stuff like that are you out your comfort zone or you're right you're, you're more worldly no i wouldn't say i'm more worldly i'm probably the worst i just start sweating and like rock back and forth in the corner and people generally just stay away from that big sweaty scotsman um but yeah it's it's not it's not a big man's world definitely you're, you're right there even the flight down from inverness you know the easy jet flight with the fly down and uh, you're just like that. i make myself as big as i can just so because like, I, I sat down there and these two people were, like, were wanting to sit beside me, went, had their seats, I just went. <laughs> what do they do then? Like, do just they just sit there? They just I mean, sit there. I want my comfort just as much. I mean, planes aren't, aren't like made, made for big people and, you know, the weird people get get the comfort. I want the comfort as well. So I spare my legs, put my lats out and just sat there like. <laughs> it's quite funny though, because we're, we're normally like on the aisle. So aisle, aisle next to each other, if that makes sense. And when the... the the trolley goes up and down, constantly hits us in the shoulder. So there's probably that much room to walk past when Tom and I are sitting next to each other. Um, but yeah, the, the flights are, are difficult, but it's just, it's only an hour flight down or an hour and 20. So it's manageable. And then you get on the the train from Gatwick into the centre of London, you're like, oh, geez, this is wild. Mm. Just busy. And then it's just, you, you're met with that like hubbub of people, that mm. noise, that... Because being from the Highlands as well, it's very, we're quite a friendly bunch. You know, you're chatting to everyone, hi, hi, Mary, how's it going today? Nice to see you. And you do that in London, you probably get punched in the face. It's, yeah, um, it's chaotic, <laughs> for sure. But that's part of your life now with the travel and stuff like that. Have you had to get used to it, like life on the road? Do people stop you when you're in London and stuff like that? Because, again, I'm going based on mine. I'm nowhere near at your level. Because you're so tall, you stand out and people are like, oh, I recognise I recognise him. But for you two... Especially, I'm going to say, Tom, because mm -hmm. you're bigger and you've got the orange T-shirt on. <laughs> like, are you getting stopped constantly? Yeah, I mean, yeah, I think, yeah, I think, you know, since every single time now we're travelling anywhere we're going, especially London, you know, you get stopped, like you said, every se second person. Not just because straw man, well, straw man, it's just because I'm bigger. Like, people are like, oh, you must play rugby, you know, a few people yesterday, or you must be rugby for England, or you're a massive guy, can I get photos? So a lot of people just think you play rugby, and just because you're bigger than the average person, they just want a photo with you. And then, yeah, like, you know, this morning, people, always, always people stopping. But, you know, it's nice because you kind of, you're getting recognised for what you're doing. And, I mean, yeah, London for me, London and Glasgow are the two busiest cities where I get stopped the most. And it's, yeah, it's pretty, uh, it's pretty kind of, you know, heartwarming that people are actually stopping and, you know, interested in what you are. But, yeah, there is a lot of, like, you know, a lot of tourists in London, not like the English, but, like, you know, the kind of the Chinese, the Japanese, they just like it because you're bigger. Like, oh, big, big guy, big guy, photo, photo, photo. Yeah, so that's exactly that's quite, it. That's quite, it's quite cool when they say that. You just kind of laugh and go, yeah, okay, and then just pause or, you know, they'll just, 
they want a photo, but it's just you. They want, they, they don't want a photo with you, so you just sit standing there, like <laughs> yeah, like Father <laughs> yeah, Christmas, yeah, just by yourself. You're like, yeah, or, you know, it's just so it's funny, yeah. But yeah, you, we get stopped everywhere we go. Now I think myself and Luke are very good at building the profile, and I think we have done the last few years, and especially you know since this year after competing, we usually just kind of sit at home and. We do like kind of the odd collab up in the highlands and stuff. But after the competition this year, we were like, well, we need to go out and travel to places. You know, we were in Amsterdam with Wim Hof. We were, you know, were going over to Iceland. We're doing the podcast here. We were doing stuff with Lord else. So we're trying to build our profile. But it just, I mean, I'm on a billboard, you know, in London and Liverpool in the underground. And it's, it's cool you're walking past mm -hmm. going, that's me, you know. It's, it's so just, cool. it's surreal, you know. And then people messing you. And that's what you get spotted on as well. I don't really get spotted, like I said, for being World's Strongest Man. But I think it's just for being the bigger guy and, I mean, it's a really cool thing to, you know, to be that six foot eight guy that people just think, you know, I say, sometimes I just say to them, oh, I'm a ballet dancer or I play rugby, you know, people say to you, do you play rugby? And I'm like, no, I, I ballet dance, you know. But so, that's hilarious, yeah. the fact that they say, do you play rugby? Like that is a thing and it is a thing. Yeah, that's yeah, great yeah. that they say that. Do you ever at any point just whisper in their ear and say, no, I'm actually um, the world's strongest man? Sometimes, yeah, sometimes, but sometimes I go, it's even America because in America it's NFL and that's, uh, you know, as soon as you get off a plane in America, Hey, dude, you play NFL. <laughs> like, so it's NFL and rugby, like rugby in UK, NFL. And so I just kind of something's go off it. I just say, I play for, I make, I make up a team and they're like, oh, cool, cool. Yeah, where do you play on? Like front row or croc, whatever it is. I'm kind of <laughs> crocs. crocs. Yeah, I just, I, I go down like the scrum and yeah, I'm one of those guys at yeah. scrum. So they're like, cool, dude, cool. So yeah, and I, yeah, but yeah, sometimes like I say to him or like someone will say, oh, he's, he's the world's strongest man. And then they're like, no, they're not. No, he's not. So. Yeah, I think it's just a very surreal. Obviously, where me and Luke are from, you know, the Highlands, there's like f a few thousand people then to come to a big city and have like all that kind of attention on you and to do these kind of really cool stuff that we do. It's just, you know, I'm very, just very grateful for it. Obviously, you know, with been having been autistic and stuff and then to think, you know, 10 years ago, none of this was possible. And then 10 years later, I'm just lifting weights and I'm doing it as a career. I'm making a life of it. It's pretty surreal that, you know, people are actually stopping or interested in what I do, interested in what Luke do, buy into our brand. And yeah, by just lifting weights, it's, it's a cool, cool feeling. So. That bit of humility in there, I'm just lifting weights. <laughs> <laughs> picking yeah. a bar up and putting it down just yeah, like any other person the, the strongest man yeah. in history soon. I know this is a, a story that you guys have told loads and it's out there in the public domain mm. but just lifting weights and I don't know whether this is because I'm fans of you guys mm. or I've always been a fan of Strongman when it's on at Christmas it's always been a kind of go to when you watch it but it feels like Luke there's been an elevation in that space like people are drawn to athletes but more so, people are drawn to like big athletes. You look at boxing, mm. heavyweight boxing. You look at the UFC, the heavyweight division. You mentioned NFL, like NBA, rugby. It's not just being an athlete. It's the size of the human as well. Mm. And we're obviously sat here as three big humans. I'm sat with two of the biggest probably in the UK. Mm -hmm. But <laughs> like, have you felt there's a shift in that space as well? Because you're, you're athletes, effectively. That's mm -hmm. what you are. But you're giant athletes. Yeah, I, I think it's the, It's still you know we talk about like the freak show aspect you know it's very much that's how strongman initially started you know in the the circuses and the the circus strongman and i think people look to like bigger people as like a giant or like it's like almost uh unattainable for some people to be that big so now they can see tom yourself at six foot fucking nine i mean that's huge that's mm. that's like a modern day giant really you know because so um, it's taller than me you're lucky. <laughs> yeah, I'm an I'm an inch taller than you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're bigger than I'm heels, Tom, on which is yeah. good. But I, I think just that that size and that grandeur is of of the human body. It's seen how far you can push that that body to see how big we can get. Um, we were chatting about it in the taxi on the way over, but someone can come in at two hundred kilos and not be a very good strongman because they don't know how to optimize their weight. And it's the same with with rugby players. You can have a 160 kilo guy looks massive but can't move can't he's not agile he doesn't know how to tackle he doesn't know how to do all those things so when you combine everything size skill technique like tom and myself and you know whoever else does i think that's when it's almost it's almost a thing of beauty sometimes seeing a big guy oh my god he can run quite fast look how strong he is look how amazing you know it's those type of things that i think people kind of warm to and and i, I like to think that generally speaking like bigger guys are usually quite nice, you know. In the strongman circuit, we're quite approachable, even though Tom looks like a scary monster sometimes. <laughs> and 
makes babies cry. Um, oh, right. But I, I think we're quite approachable. And when people come up to, certainly Tom and I, you know, we're very like welcoming and, and kind of uh, friendly to people. Because again, as Tom says, it's a it's a really big kind of honour and privilege that people take the time to come up and ask for a photo or have a little chat. And especially now, in, you know, about mental health or autism and things like that. That's that's what really kind of stands out. And just because Tom's six foot eight, I'm six foot three, and you know we're pretty heavy, doesn't mean we're anything different. But I don't know. I think it's just that. Stories of old, you know, like going back to the gladiators and that kind of, it's almost like romanticising a little bit about it, you know. We've all seen gladiator when you come into the Coliseum or the, the, the big arena, you know, you're battling to the death. And sometimes that's what it feels like in Strongman, you know, you're going into that big arena and you're you're putting your body on the line and, and seeing what you can do. And um, at the end of the day, you shake each other's hands, give each other a cuddle and, you know, you want everyone to lift as much as they can, but secretly you're always hoping that you're lifting the most. I think, I think it's people's reactions for as well, like with the tall, because well, my wife's five foot, <laughs> so like, obviously, you know, when, you, when you're going for airports or when you're at expos, <laughs> she's beside us. Everyone's just... Mm. Well, you know what? I saw yeah. you on the Royal Mile. You might remember it <laughs> years ago. You looked at me and I looked at you and I saw you. I think it would have been your girlfriend oh, yeah. at the time. It was a yeah, long yeah. time ago. And like, naturally, I'm one that gets looked at, right? <laughs> so I don't like being looked at all the time. Yeah, obviously, yeah, that yeah. happens. But I found myself like looking at you, and it was because yeah. you were with your partner who yeah. was so small yeah, as well. That's, you know, by yourself, you feel it. But when you're with, yeah, when I'm with her, they're just like, whoa. Some of them sometimes even say, is she your daughter? Or like, and I'm just like, <laughs> like it's just it's just mad the reaction. Because that's, that's the funny part about it. You know, you're so big, but then it's just like, she, I, I don't do it, but she talks to her so like, these guys are like, got their jaws are dropping and it's just funny. Her reaction is, is priceless because she doesn't like people watching. She's like, why are they watching? Why are they doing this? But it's so, so funny, especially when you're going through an airport. It's just me and Luke and it's just like everyone just lets these freezes and they're just, their mouth's just open wide and that's quite, that's, that's the kind of funniest bit as well. That's when you realise, yeah, I'm quite big then, you know. And I mean, yeah. you probably get that as well going through people like, you know, six foot nine, yeah, it depends what mood you're in. Like, if I'm in a good yeah. mood or, yeah, yeah. like, high energy or whatever, that it's fine. But I think the difference is with you guys is that you're using your size and using that to, like, the utmost. Mm. Like, in, in yeah, yeah. probably the best arena, if we use that analogy, mm -hmm. like, there is. Mm -hmm. You know, like, some people are, are tall or they're big, but they don't, or they've never had the opportunity to to use their size. Mm -hmm. And that's one thing I wanted to ask about, like looking at the stuff that you've done online, seeing like interviews with your dad. Mm -hmm. Like he's not big, is not he? Like, I, 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 when I say he's not big, like he's not six foot three, six foot no, four, he's not no. six foot eight. He's, nice. average. he's, average. he's an average man. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I get this all the time. Like how the hell <laughs> does a mum and dad up in the Highlands yeah. produce two humans your size have you worked that out or not no I don't know a couple of tall milkmen I mean, even, even, our wee, even, cause even our wee brother's six foot five so yeah. there's three of us I mean and I, one of our sisters is you know, a tall, taller for yeah. a, a girl as well so yeah, I mean is there a throwback gene because for, for me I, I mean mine you might laugh about this no word of lie you mentioned like Chinese people and Japanese people yeah, yeah. taking pictures I'm a quarter Chinese <laughs> and people are like where's the quarter Chinese I look down at the, at the little boy <laughs> No, that must be the only thing because Jesus is not But, but I, I, it's a throwback. So my sister's six foot, my brother's six six, my half brother's six six, sorry. Jesus. And he looks, it's hilarious. He looks Chinese. And people think, oh, you're taking the piss. You're almost being racist when you say it. I'm like, no, no, yeah, yeah. genuinely. And then I've done a bit of research on it. So there's a throwback gene in Shanghai where people say, oh, Chinese people are notoriously small, mm. which they are. But mm. the tallest basketballer ever was Yao Ming, yeah, was seven yeah, foot yeah, eight. Yeah, yeah. Tallest woman's Mongolian, which is effectively yeah, China as well. So there actually is a throwback. But with the Stoltmans, is there like a Viking gene that's kind of well, n we, nipped we, in there? We came, um, our, our dad and our dad's side, it was Polish and German. Well, that, yeah, that's something. So, that, that, so like, and dad's like cousins, um, relatives in the Polish side, uh, they were really tall. So a lot of the guys were like six foot six, six foot seven. And on the German side as well, Germans are, some of them are quite big big brutes as well so I think that's probably where it stems from and then on our mum's side all the our cousins on our mum's side are all six foot three plus as well so it's a notoriously quite big family so it's in there it's in there yeah there's something that's kind of I don't know made us we need to look and see if we've got any Chinese in here as well. <laughs> I <laughs> bet you don't want it no <laughs> you don't want it without being horrible but it ain't the best to be. <laughs> it's yeah. a, a concoction of 
Yeah, nationalities. It's, but <coughs> it's just that mix, isn't it? So if you're mixing nationalities and races and stuff, there's going to be something that's going to hopefully kind of pop up and it could have reacted a different way and we could have all been, you know, shorter and maybe really smart, I don't know. Um, mm -hmm. Maybe that would have been easier. I don't know if we were all dead intelligent. Wouldn't have been as cool, though. No, That's no, right. it wouldn't. <laughs> yeah. So I don't know, yeah, but we've, it's, it's quite a notoriously, like our family yeah. uh, on the Stoltman side and then on our mum's side. Um, yeah, so there's a lot of big, big fuckers about. I don't really know so. where it came from, for, but <clears throat> there's, like I said, a lot of yeah. big, big people in our family. So. Yeah. None as big as you, I don't think. You're there. One, uh, our cousins, there's one cousin we've got on my mum's side that's six foot nine, six foot ten. Okay. So, uh, he's big, and I'm just like, yeah, where did you get that from either? Because, again, his siblings aren't aren't the biggest, but, yeah, must just be a secret gene somewhere in the somewhere down the line. Eh? So. Yeah, because when the, you look at the, the strong men, like, the, I know there's a few, I know, like, Thor would be about yeah, your Thor, Brian Shaw, size. Yeah. yeah, so, I mean, they are, they, they, you can be six foot seven, six foot eight, yeah, yeah. but they're not much bigger than that. They're probably, historically, Luke, more your size, which is, what, six four? Six three, six four. yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah. That, would, but that would be perceived before as the optimum size of a strong man, right? Yeah, and it's kind of changed. It's kind of, you know, with whatever you know over the last few years it's changed to becoming more of a tall person um but then you go back a few years ago alexei novikov ukrainian mm. strongman he's six one six one and six, one of the lightest as well six so. one and one of the lightest guys in, in our yeah, in the world's strongest man and he won world's strongest man so but he was moving quick he was like a quick mover very quick yeah, very yeah. explosive and he, and he optimizes it's what we go back to starting what we said before it's like optimizing your strength you know your weight so alexi's maybe 130 140 kilos but he optimizes it so well he's been training since he was eight years old doing mm. strongman his granddad made all his strongman equipment and stuff and he optimised every every kind of um, ounce of strength he had. But then on the other side, you know, you've got the likes of Half Thor, you know, from Iceland, who's six eight, six nine, he huge. I remember a few years ago, you sat in these type of chairs and you just couldn't see the chair. He was so like like gigantic. It was ridiculous. Like I, I mean, I see Tom all the time, and I know he's a big guy, but like Thor, I think that time was probably. 200 plus yeah, kilos. Yeah, because that's yeah. when he was, he's leaned up now, yeah, obviously, yeah. hasn't he? Oh, but. He was just huge. And, and same with Brian Shaw. I remember seeing Brian Shaw take his top off for the first time. And I think we are in Botswana. i just come from the oil rigs. I had to fly straight out to, to Botswana to compete in World's Strongest Man. Brian Shaw takes his shirt off when we're going through event familiarisation. <laughs> Fucking hell, man. What am I doing here? <laughs> this guy's, honestly, the thickness on him. Mm. It was like, that's what got me. He was so thick. Like, Jesus, man, this is wild. Why? I just wanted to go home then. I was like, this is stupid. Thankfully, he wasn't in my group, so it wasn't too bad. But yeah, it's in years gone by, it was more the the kind of six foot three, six foot four, like Marius Puzinowski. Yeah, I remember him. Yeah, as well. like, is he Polish? Was it? Polish, yeah, yeah. yeah. Shredded. Oh, just yeah. insane. Body could step on a bodybuilding. Stage yeah, he everything. he was my favourite. I'll be honest, yeah, like, just, uh, just because aesthetically he looked was, good as well. That's why I wanted to get into it because of him. him oh really? And him and Derek Poundstone, because Marius was up, but Derek Poundstone was at my height as well, and he was shredding. I was like, these two guys are different than. I mean, the other the older Strom were a bit, you know, fat and stuff. So, but Marius, I was just like. Mm -hmm. That's a superhero, man. The, mm. the abs. Oh, he was crazy. crazy he was a right showboater as well. Yeah. He was pulling the anchor and chain one time and everyone else was doing it two hands. And he did it one hand and he's posing to the crowd. With <laughs> that a boy. Just... Oh. But you imagine like competing against that. You're like, God, this guy's doing it so easy and it's so hard. It's like the psychological yeah. games he played with everyone. The charisma as well. Yeah. And, yeah, the awe around him. So it was cool. And then you go back, you know, to the earlier days with John Paul Sigmundson. The Viking, you know, the he was like the first real charismatic strong man that mm. was like shouting to the crowd and I am the Viking, and you know, and giving all, that was class. You know, that was I think that's what any sport needs. You need to have that charismatic kind of energy and and you know give back to the crowd because I mean a lot of us, you know, I mean I like to think we're pretty we get pretty hyped up, but a lot of guys, you know, it's like I am strong. And then that's it, you know. It's but you have to maybe have a character to play or, or let out something, you know, because we all have that something inside us, you know, that raw emotion when you're doing well. It's like when you're rugby, you know, you're fucking pumped up, you know, you need to let that go and um, just have that raw emotion. And I think that's what's cool now when you see the guys, 
Aye, it's, it's class. So I, that, for me, that's what I've fallen in love with when I see it. They, and I love, and it's easy to say the gladiatorial aspect, like mm. rugby, you know, NFL, them kind of contact sports, but because of the dust, you know what I mean? And the dust and you're picking up the stones and you're dra <laughs> dragging shit about that's like heavy. There is a gladiatorial like feel and kind of look yeah. to the sport that you're in. Mm. So to play that like, fucking come on, <laughs> at the end, I can't imagine oh. the feeling and the adrenaline you must oh. get, especially when you're at the top end. So if you're winning it or you're close to winning it and you're competitive like in that space, yeah. like the feeling must be something that is probably unexplainable and then winning it as well. Oh, it's you know they say it's like the, the release of dopamine when you win something. So that's why like gambling is, is so addictive. It's like winning is so addictive because it gives you that. Oh, I'm invincible! <laughs> You're standing that podium. Um, like Tom winning world strongest man twice. I got in a couple of podiums. Europe strongest man world tour finals and that elation you feel. You're like, I could do this all the time. Mm. Um, but it just. You're almost, it's like almost like an outer body experience, mm. isn't it? When you do it, when you when you when you're doing when you win something, and it's the same as any sport. When you win something, you've worked so hard for like years and years and years, um, and it finally all comes together in that perfect, almost like a masterpiece, isn't it? You, mm. Everything just comes in. It's like, oh, fucking every nice. emotion comes out of you. Yeah. Know, cause when I, you know, when I won my first world, I mean, you know, I wasn't. It's so boring, but like I, when I'm when I'm doing my events, based on my job, I try and keep as focused as I can. But I remember, like you know, obviously it was everyone wanted the me versus Brian Shaw sh uh, sh showdown, and like who's the best at stone. I remember seeing on the line with him. Luke had just finished his stone run, and Brian was in the back with his guys, and I was by myself. You know, I was like, oh, Brian Shaw, Brian Shaw, Brian Shaw. Luke, where are you? How's it? And then Luke just came in, like literally, like a raging bull. I was like, oh shit. <laughs> <laughs> and then he just came and went mental at me and I was like, like I got scared because I'd never seen him like that angry and I was like oh and so that to me just got me so pumped up and I was like I respect Brian Shaw but I was like he is a dead man like I'm going to go out as in because you've yeah. gone in so you, you're looking for your brother because, you've run like, in like you know when you're with Brian Shaw and his team I was beside him by myself kind of mm. like struggling up like Brian's been in this position so many times but I'm in this position for my first time and this could be my first title and I could just see Brian Shaw, you know, cool. And I was just, and Luke came in, yeah, just a raging bull. I was like, shit, Brian Shaw's dead. Like, I just was like, in my head, he's dead. And I just literally remember just doing all five stones. Brian was on his, like, third one when I was on my last one. Turned around. And I it just, it's just like the whole world just lifts off your shoulder. Just lay to the ground, crying, going mental, like, shouting there, Scotland, Scotland, Scotland. So, yeah, it was unbelievable. But, yeah, you just get that big, massive rush. And that rush stays with you for, like, weeks and weeks and weeks after especially the first one because it was covid i only had luke there didn't have my family my wife so you go back home and you just relive it all and you just keep doing the memories mm. you're like i never want this to go yeah away, i want, more, I want, I want it again. more and more and more and more and more and yeah it's like it's like an addiction and then you just go and train harder and then i did it the second year with the family again and you just oh it's yeah it's, it's a feeling that you can't explain even like doing the giants live like the ones in glasgow that just happened that you know, Luke won the first year I won this year, and like that's in your home, your home country, and the crowd's unbelievable. Mm. Like when I lifted the last stone, I think it was the noisiest. What did they measure? It was like the noisiest. Yeah, the the meter. Yeah, the meter reader was the noisiest, yeah. and I just sat stood there for like ten seconds. I, mm. like I couldn't do any emotions, and then after, and the whole crowd were just up on their feet, and you're just like, this is what you live for, like you know, like to. So to watch this and like seven eight years ago it was in a wee car park to this now and I'm on top it's like this is this is what you want and it just gets so addicting so addicting mm. so addicting and yeah it's incredible like what victory can do to you but even you know top three to second first place but yeah it's been somebody well like I said I don't showboat but when I win or when I do something cool it's said uh, the crowd just you give that adrenaline it's like that 12th man in it you know in rugby and football they give you that kind of extra yeah. boost but yeah it's an unbelievable feeling and you get goosebumps you get oh it's just well i'm getting goosebumps listening to you talk about yeah, it because just, this is what like they talk about it in sport and they, we spoke about it in rugby it's like that a coach said to me it's that 30 seconds of euphoria mm. having won a game that and i get goosebumps talking about it now <laughs> that you will never get and unless you've had it like you can never explain like I think you lads have explained it so well like all the training everything that goes in behind the years and years of pain the injury the diet the sacrifice all these different things that go in for that one moment of like the feeling of being alive and I think that that's why sports people struggle don't they like because 
once you've had them feelings, I can look at the 03 England team, I don't know, it's just one example, mm. but when Johnny drops that goal yeah, yeah. and we know about Johnny's mental health and mm. the way that he talks about things, how do you relive that moment? Like, yeah. as in, especially in that sport where, well, like every sport, you're going to retire at 35, <clears> maybe a little bit later yeah, yeah. as strong men, but to have tasted it and that feeling of alive, it's, it's really difficult to explain. Mm. And like, I think you've explained it really well and no more in them sports, the gladiatorial sports, where it is about being a man and mm. it's about being unapologetic about being a fucking strong man mm -hmm. and the strongest man <laughs> in the world or the strongest men in the world. Yeah, yeah. You know, so you, you talk about the alpha part yeah. of it, like boxing's the same. I think that that's why it is the yeah, same yeah. because as a boxer, you, like, you're knocking people out. <laughs> that feeling of doing that, I, it's probably unimaginable how you feel when you've done that. You're Mike Tyson, you're the hardest man on the, in the world. Yeah, crazy. You yeah. know, you're the strongest men in the world, like it's a thing. Mm. Hey. Not that, so mine wasn't like that. We won a, a, a Champions Cup. I played about three minutes and got one turnover, and that was it. And that was my moment of that euphoria. So I tasted it slightly. It's difficult then, like you say, afterwards. And I guess that's why a lot of like athletes, men as well especially, I think, struggle with the old the head after it. You know, mm. so I think that's very important for Tom and I because like we know that it's a, it's not going to be. The, longev the longevity of having or being world's strongest man is, is relatively short. Um, so now it's like, like, what do we do now? So it's, that's why we're putting an emphasis on the brand, raising the profile. And then, like, when we sell a T-shirt, it's still get that little, oh, that's class. Yeah. Like, We've got someone from Japan buying our T-shirt. That's insane. You know, so it's those little things that you can take now. And if you didn't, if we stopped doing strongman, I had nothing, nothing after, I'd be back in the oil rigs. Tom would be... Yeah, doing whatever. What would you be doing? <laughs> Playing Xbox or something. Yeah. <laughs> that's all the opposite. That's, yeah, that's what Luke said. I mean, because that's what, like, obviously Luke's got a few years left to compete. But that's what I get scared of is, you know, like, I've still, you know, all, everything going well, no injuries and stuff. I've still got, like, 10, 11 years, but I don't want to think past that because you know, I always visualise still being on the top because it's mm. that buzz. You know, like, when mm. things are going down in training, I'll watch and I'll go, like, this is what I live for, this, like, 30 seconds of... You know that win in that that moment, and then it's like you know in ten years' time if this goes away from me, it's like what do you do? And that's luckily you know we do have the brand and stuff as well, but it's just you always get scared that this is going to get taken away. It could get taken away tomorrow. Mm -hmm. It could get taken away in three years, five years, ten years. But yeah, I always you just have to relive it all the time, and that's what that's why like Luke always goes like, oh, what you, what should we like? They're building the brand, and like oh, in ten years' time, what are you going to do? It's like <laughs> I want to be doing this till I die because like. <laughs> I just, you know, you just love winning and you just love competing and it's just, yeah, it's a scary moment. That's why, like, I'm quite glad that I'm 29 looks nearly older because, you know, he's coming to You're not to 40 him. yet, though, are you? No. You're, You're not old. I'm, how old are you? I've just turned, no, I say, I keep telling everyone I've just turned 40. I'm 41 tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> just turned 40. Happy birthday. Yeah, hey. I'm 41 uh, tomorrow. All right, okay. Yeah, all that's right. the turning point. Uh, that is the turning point. Uh, but, like, but the longevity of it mm. and what is the peak strength, do they say? Uh, is it in your thirties or not? Because what you, you uh, you're Tommy, you're twenty nine. Twenty nine, but I mean, so like everyone's different. Because like, you know, like for example, Mark Felix, who's you know, now I think like fifty six yeah, years old. He's, he's just that's he's just, ridiculous. He's just retired and and he hit like, eleven. Well, he's competing in this. The, yeah, the but weekend. I mean, like at world strongest, he's just retired from world strongest man last year and he hit like fifteen world strongest man finals so in a row. But he started at like late twenties. So okay. like, I think Mark's the perfect example. You can look after your body. And I think, like, anyone that sees Mark on the street doesn't think he's 56 years old or whatever he is. But, well, like, for myself, I want to be able to, like, even if I'm not at the top at World Strongest Man, I still want to be doing the sport till, you know, till I can't really kind of do it. But, like, you can't really put a time on your career because, for me, if you put a time on your career, it's just, you're just going to get, like, you're just fighting for that, you know, that day to come. You're just waiting for that day to come. For, for, for me, it's like, I'll just keep going unless I get injured or a doctor tells me to stop. But I just want to keep, because... This is why we do it. We love lifting weights. We love competing and we love performing. And yeah, the business side's good, but I'll always want to do something to perform. But I think all going good, I want to be here till like 50, 55 years old. And, you know, when we're all strong, man, at 55 years old. All right, guys. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, a a cool. walking stick. Yeah. Oh, yeah, I'll have a walking stick, but I'll still be doing something. But yeah, it's. <laughs> I, think, I, I always look at Mark Felix for like when people ask me this question, like, oh, I'm 40 years old, I'm too old to do straw man oh, look at Mark Felix he's 55 years old and last year he was still you know one of the best at deadlifts repping in the world and he's the best at like the grip stuff and he's a 55 year old man it's you know, yeah. it's bonkers how he can still keep up with the young guys and you know the best in the world which is, is nuts too for me because 
most 55 year old men are retired and you know just or Fucked. an office job yeah yeah, Fucked, yeah basically yeah so how was it for you for giving up like the rugby and everything and like you experienced that high like you say in the, mm. the cup and but then what do you get from now is it like the podcast doing your presenting mm. and stuff do you get yeah, a little bit from yeah, it a little bit yeah a little bit just world, a little yeah the world cup being close to the the gladiators pitch side that gave me the biggest buzz yeah, because i was i was there and not that i've experienced winning a world cup but you're there with like-minded men. Yeah, yeah. And that was the biggest void for me was you're in a testosterone fueled <clears throat> brotherhood environment and then it's gone. Yeah, yeah. And like listen to you chat, Tom, about thinking about the future and something like that. Not that I'm here to give you advice, but one thing as a rugby player, you knew that your career was going to be short. You know, I got to 34 and I limped to 34. I was fucked by the end. Um, destroyed my thyroid, had a broken rib, was injections, painkiller. So I was, a dead dog I would have been put down. But my, the one thing that I wish, and I did it towards it, the end of my career, was I enjoyed the moment. Mm. Whereas before it was always about like, what's next, what's next, here we go, which is a sports yeah, yeah. man, woman's mindset, isn't it? That's yeah. what you do, what is next, I'm on to the next. Whereas I made sure that the back end of my career, I didn't have music on before the games, I'd look up in the stadium. Right. When I played for Scotland, I made sure that I took in the energy and the atmosphere yeah. because I remember Jason White, you might remember Jason White playing yeah. in the back row for Scotland, number six. Like he said, it'll be gone like that. And when he said that, I was like, you know, you're right. And then it was gone. And you never replicate mm. them things again. Like you just don't know, I've got kids, I'm lucky enough to have children, which is obviously amazing. But yeah. I think as a, a man, mm. as an athlete, as someone who loved the contact, loved the physical, it was gone and I was fucked. So it yeah. wasn't as if like I could still do it. So that was probably easier. Mm. There isn't, like, you don't replicate it. Like, I've got a Watt bike. You might have seen it on social media. I'm posting <laughs> some stuff. You you two would be unbelievable on that. <laughs> the Watt bike. But that's my go-to. <coughs> like, I smashed the Watt bike. I love doing a little... I'm not going to say weights. I love doing a bit of weights yeah. as well. But yeah. I think that that's why, like, so lucky to be a high-level elite sport, mm. but... The sadness around it is, is that it's going to end. It's going to end. Mm -hmm. Like you're not like an accountant or a lawyer, or yeah. you're in that. Not that you get the same thrill, but it is going to end at some point. Because uh, just what you're saying, they were like <clears throat> not listening to music. That's why I actually stopped putting my headphones on for these competition. I always like walk out now and soak in the atmosphere, soak in the crowd, soak in the, you know, the stadiums. Because you're, I just breathe in like. I'm competing here, and like, I only I only ever put like music now on at the side of me and just listen. But I've stopped listening to headphones and take every single thing in because like you said this moment could be you know go in a minute and you want to be able to like re kind of hear the crowd in your brain mm. and re kind of see the lights and stuff so yeah, I kind of started doing that now is like, the last few competitions just headphones away and really enjoy being there because yeah you, you can like I said it can go it can go in a heartbeat so you need to enjoy every single moment so yeah well the psychology kind of part wasn't there either when I played mm. and like you see you guys doing like who, who would have thought Wim Hof 15 years ago would be someone now <laughs> oh wild you know the cold as back in the day we would have been what the fuck yeah. in hell pilates yoga meditation what is this bollocks whereas now it's everything the yeah. mind and it wasn't back then it was just like toughen up mm -hmm. fucking strap your boots on regardless of what state your body is is in take a load of painkillers yeah. and off you go whereas there's a big shift now isn't there with the the mental aspect the headspace mm -hmm. and you, you get that right then everything will follow. Like I know, like maybe to you, Luke, like talking about that. Yeah. And when you're not just managing yourself, you support your brother as well. I'm sure that headspace is probably the point of difference, right? Definitely. I mean, that's, um, you know, it's a combined effort between Tom and myself. You know, it's, we kind of made that decision to look after ourselves mentally. Um, a couple of years ago, back in 2019, 2020, um, you know, we decided to speak to a clinical psychologist. Actually, um, I knew this this doctor, Amy, um, and spoke to her and said, oh, Amy, you know, I think Tom might benefit with some help from you. And she said, yeah, yeah, that'd be brilliant. Love to help him. And, um, you know, just with, there was like a mystery event and Tom struggled. You struggled with that a little bit, didn't you? And so she said, yeah, I'd love to, love to talk to him. That'd be great. And she said, oh, what about you? I said, what do you mean, Amy? I'm fine. I'm sound. I'm... This is class, like old school. Yeah, I'm fine. You know, coming from the, the rigs, rigs workers, I worked like seventeen <laughs> yeah, yeah. years offshore in the oil rigs, and I oh, don't worry about it. Just go and drink, and it'll be fine. And um, she said, "Oh, let's just have a wee look." And we did a few things, and 
she didn't say it, but she's basically a little bit mental. So let's have a wee look at you and see how we can fix that. Because um, being from the Highlands as well, we down ourselves quite a lot. You know, and Scottish, I think Scottish folk do that. Oh, we're just Scottish. What we, we just drink whiskey and have a battered Mars bar, and you know that we kind of down ourselves a lot. So it was like transforming that mindset was so important to go and thinking, you know what, fuck this man, we're, we're two of the strongest men in the world. And then after we started speaking to her, Tom won uh, World's Strongest Man the first time, literally six months later, I then won Europe's Strongest Man and then went on to win the, the first time in Glasgow World Tour Finals. And it's it's no like coincidence, you know. You can say, oh, well, it was just because that guy wasn't there, or it was just a good set of events, and and it wasn't. It was because we started looking after ourselves mentally, um, and then that was speaking to the clinical psychologist. But then Tom and I were, were kind of quite big with the cold water stuff, you know. That's um, that's massive, and a lot of people say, oh, it's just a fad or a phase and all this stuff, but. Like, we've been doing that in the cold since we were children, but just not realising, you know, how, how <laughs> yeah. fucking happy it makes yeah. you. You know what I mean? You go in at the sea, like, that's our summer holidays. Our holidays was spent, so you got Invergarden, and then maybe 40 minutes away, there's a place called Embo, Granny's Healing Hame, um, Caravan Park, you mm. know, so we didn't go away in, like, out of Spain or anything like that for a long, long time. So when we were younger, we went to there, set up a tent, went in the sea with mum and dad and you had the best time. You're always buzzing. You got to blow up, you know, the little ilos, you, know, you blew up that and they like, went in the waves and, and I'm like, fucking hell, that was class. And then you're trying to like, you're almost trying to go back to being a kid. You know, you want, oh, I wish I was a kid again. So happy, it was so easy. And things can be easy, but you just got to let this kind of, the old noggin go sometimes, don't you? And um, for me going into cold water, in the morning, seeing a sunrise and like being reconnected with like Mother Nature, and like I get to connect with Mum. We lost Mum back in two thousand sixteen, mm -hmm. so she was like the biggest kind of thing for us. But but now I get to see her every morning. And I'm chilling. I'm like, oh, hey Mum, how's it going? Have a wee cry in the water, um, laugh, get angry, um, get to do it with Tom. You know, we do the the cold water after the training sessions as well. Tom comes to the beach sometimes as well, and it's just a nice way of being reconnected to that kind of little inner child you know that little mischievous child oh i want to throw some stones <laughs> that's mm -hmm. fun you know doing those type of things and and there's so many ways now like you said you know maybe 10 years ago and i'd be the same probably five years ago if i was speaking like this five years ago i'd shake myself and say stop in a family look good mm -hmm. what are you talking cold water and oh um like i do a thing on, on a thursday night i go to a yurt with a group of guys, there's some women, and we uh, we do chanting, we do like mantras and dramming, mm -hmm. and like it's wild. It's like we chant om, and you know, so it's like Tom's Scot not feeling the air. <laughs> you, you, you were at that point, yeah. It's a Scottish Wim Hof, I'm just like, there's a good brand, good brand yeah, there's a good brand in Wim Hof, yeah. So, Luke Hoff, um, <laughs> Luke Hoff, but it's it's just realizing that there is a lot of others, like these type of like mantras and chanting and all that they, they've been going on for tens of thousands of years like predates you know like the shamanic practices and stuff that predates any religion you know it's 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 been there for so long so why wouldn't it work you know the vibrations you talk about mm. the vibrations you know if you've got someone drumming like you're like whoa you go into a trance like state um that's why i think when you're in a crowd, you know, when we get into a crowd and you get in, people are cheering like so loud, you're like, oh, and you feel that adrenaline that can spike you, you know, music as well. Yeah. So why can't it be? Why can't we just do things like that? And but yeah, five years ago, if I was wearing a big poncho going to a yurt <laughs> on a Thursday night chanting, I'd be like, what are you doing, you maniac? But it's it's breaking that stigma down, I think, isn't it? It's because it was an issue, like burying our feelings and not talking about it and and just like when mum mum passed away a week after i went straight back out to the rigs and started working because i was like oh well that's what mum would want like start work and be fine and you know i would be you know in the shower sitting in the shower offshore crying and that's not okay you know and then you go down at work oh, how's it going guys it was a good day today and go to the gym and um and you would never and never open up and then that's when you know, maybe drinking too much, self-sabotaging and all those things related with grief kind of came to me and um, I wasn't doing mum's memory of justice by doing that. But now, hopefully, 
you know, wherever mum is looking down on us, I hope she's smiling and think, that's my boy, he's a wee bit mental, but I still love him. Because she was a little bit mental, wasn't she? Mum was like... She was the definition of mental. <laughs> yeah. She was into her tie-dye stuff, and like, she was like a gardener, she plants sunflowers, and, and now every year, our dad plants about seven or 8,000 sunflowers along his wall, you know, as, as like a memorial to mum every summer. So you go into dad's garden, it's like sunflowers, flowers, it's like, poor And... and those things are nice, I, I think, mm. um, because again, we live in quite a mad world. It's like, buy, 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 buy. We need to buy this, buy, 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 buy. and we get caught up with all this kind of material stuff, material about, stuff. Yeah. And sometimes it's just nice just to go for a like when, when you're feeling in a shitty mood, like going for a walk along the beach or walk in the woods or a walk with your kids or whatever. That kind of sorts out, clears your mm. head. So. Why can't we be doing that a little bit more? Like seeing a sunrise is pretty cool. Yeah, exactly. And so. people like that. It's about it's trendy. You see it all online, but it is a fact. Like mm. when you actually dig into it and you look into it properly. Not that I've done these things of walking around in bare feet and stuff like mm. that, but there's stuff that I think are interesting. Like I'm a big believer in the cold therapy stuff, mm. like the saunas, the training. Which again, like people before were like, oh, you know, training's just for people who play sport. Yeah. And now the craze is that everyone, you need to get up and train, like, you know, this stuff like fasting and all these different things and looking after yourself and the mental health aspect mm. wasn't there when I was playing. And having someone like you talk about it, I know it's something that you've spoken about before, and there'll be part of that with the grief that you've been through mm. as well that may be triggered. Mm -hmm. you to go and do that but it is quite funny isn't it that you did that as kids mm -hmm. and not only does it bring back the nostalgia of doing that as a kid but actually it's probably benefited you to where you are today to mm -hmm. live a lifestyle like that mm -hmm. you know like out in the elements out in the cold out in the outdoors like the sun isn't there but it is it's behind the clouds yeah somewhere you know <laughs> living that but with um with your story the the, the unique part of it which i fell in love with and is is Really, really interesting, but maybe not that interesting when you talk about it, is the brotherhood and mm. the fact that you are brothers. And I've heard you talk about when your mum passed that you felt like you had the responsibility to look after your brother and stuff like that. But your story as well, Tom, of what you went through as a kid, like that, not that it's all stories and stories and stories that build this unbelievable narrative, but the, the sincerity and how genuine mm. it is. Like that I'm drawn to that and so many people are drawn to you in that space because... You know, you watch Tom win World's Strongest Man. If like you're his mate, right, and you're not his brother, and he wins it, like you're buzzing for him. But mm. there's a bit of you fucking, you know. <laughs> and I don't know if you have that at all, but you can just see how much you love your brother and how much you do for him and how much it means in that. You know what I mean? It's a special bond that you've got, is what I'm trying to say. Yeah, I, th I think it is it's very much so. You know, because I, I, and it's the age gap as well. I think because it's ten years um, <clears throat> when Tom was younger. I, he got diagnosed with autism when he was quite young, and like Tom, Tom doesn't. You don't really real like remember like the the full hardship that he went through because it's still quite a traumatic yeah, thing. So, for yeah, you, it's so. such a nightmare. So, like, the only way I can remember things sometimes is by looking at pictures, which is weird because I never ever thought I think oh, yeah, I was diagnosed with autism at a young age, I was all right. But then I look at a picture and Luke tells a story or whatever. So yeah, it's it's just like a nightmare. It's weird, like from say eleven years old below that. My wife, my life's like a memory, uh, a distant memory. I don't remember anything. Yeah, just just on that then, just with autism yeah. now, and these things are spoken about ADHD, especially yeah. in boys, yeah. like autism in kids, and they t speak about them now in such a, a better way in terms of being a superpower, which clearly it was for you. But just look before you, mm -hmm. we, we talk about the being brothers thing, but talk talk to us what it was like as a, a youngster growing up with that, from what you remember, how difficult it was. Especially being in the Highlands, you know, not that you need to be in London to be diagnosed, yeah. but being in a, a kind of a family that lived in the outdoors, all these things, and you're probably seen as not normal, like a weird kid or what, yeah. whatever it is. Yeah, I mean, like, because uh, I mean, obviously, I've lived with it my whole life, but I think the thing that helped me get through was I had a, such a supportive family. I mean, my mum was my root. Like, I always used to go to her for everything, like problems, high and low. She was basically the stay at home mum for me. Like, obviously, having four other siblings. They sacrificed loads of stuff to make sure I had the best life possible. Like, I love football. Football was the thing that I wanted to do as a kid. And my wee brother despised football. Like, absolutely 
hated everything to do with it, but he came to football training with me, stood in goals all day, every day in the garden, and just let me kick balls at him. Because that didn't make him feel better, but he knew it would make me feel better, and it would make my life better, and it would make my family's life so much easier and better. And then obviously my dad as well, didn't really much do football when he was home in the garden every single day. They would try up, they would literally drive me to every single football game. I'd play for my local football club. They'd drive me home and away and just, you know, support me that way. And like that's the only time I felt normal. But then in school, you know, I'd get bullied a wee bit. I would just feel like I couldn't do like you know, when I was like eleven, twelve years old, these like my these eleven, twelve year old kids were so much smarter than me. I just thought, you know, I can't go to the school. Why am I kind of, you know, I thought, dumb, why am I different? Why can I not sleep over at my, I couldn't sleep over at my friend's house. I couldn't go on a train from Invergordon to Holness, which is two minutes away. My friends would do things. I couldn't do things with my family. And why was that? Was that like anxiety that just, you have? Yeah, anxiety and just always wanting my mum because I was mm. so glued to my mum from a young age. And, you know, for me to get diagnosed with autism, the schools didn't believe, my mum, no one believed her. So she had to like record me doing my kind of behaviours and give it to the school and say, this is what Tom's like. And you know, for a mum to do that, it's like it's heartbreaking because they didn't believe her. And then you know, I finally got diagnosed that way. So in school, I got a wee bit of help. But yeah, like the kids never said to me, "Oh, you're different." But like, I try and go over to my friend's house to sleep over, and at eleven p.m., I'd have to call my mum saying, "You have to come for me." And then they would be like, "You know, why? Why is Tom not like? Does Tom not like me or?" Why is Tom doing this? Does he not like my parents? Do he not like this? And I did that with everything I'd done. Even, like, even though it was five minutes away from my house, I had a friend that was next door to my mum and dad's house and I literally still had to go home at 11 p.m. So all that kind of stuff to me, you know, I kept it on, but it was just going through my head all the time. Like, you know, I'd lock myself in my room and play Xbox and and then just go like, why, why can't I be normal? Why can Luke get a job? Why can my wee brother socialise with friends? Why does my sister do this? And why can't I... Why is my, why has someone like got me on this earth and just not let me be normal? And it just kept going through my head because obviously when you're 10, 11, 12 years old, you just kind of, you don't think there's anything wrong with you. You just think I'm just a crazy kid. And that's what a lot of people thought. And I'd go to supermarkets and, you know, as like, a, I'd like, you know, fling things off shelves. I would try and get like, just, I'd want to do a lot of stimulating things. And, you know, people just look at you and look at my mum and be like, this kid's crazy. And then, like, she'd go out with, like, you know, my wee brother Luke and stuff, and they'd be like, why is, why is this kid different to these four? Like, it's, it doesn't make sense. So, yeah, it was very, very hard growing up like that. They're, I think the lucky thing is actually being from the island, because if I was from a bigger city, I think there would have been so much more people, like, looking at me. But being from the highlands, and my mum being so supportive, and then my sister as well, knowing about autism, these they were the two people that were, like, you know, so obviously... I didn't really have much of a relationship with Luke because, you know, he's tw when I'm 10, 11 years old, he's 21, 22, doing his own thing. So it was just very, very hard. And then football got taken away from me because I was like, I'm never going to be a professional footballer. But every single thing I did, I quit because when things got uncomfortable, I just had my mum at the side so I knew I could just go back to her. Like, you know, I'd go to college, quit. I'd have a job, quit. I'd try other sports, just quit every single thing. I just thought to myself, like, I eventually just locked myself in my room and was like, you know, what's the point of being here? Like, I let's see, can't do what Luke does, can't do what my wee brother's doing. I need to be a role model for my wee brother, can't be that. Can't go offshore because I'm petrified of going away at my house myself. Can't even travel five minutes by myself. How am I meant to be here? And it, yeah, it was just so, so bad. And like, you know, just, I always just thought to myself, it wasn't people that labeled me. I labeled myself because I just was like, why can't I do this stuff? Like in my head, I just all the time, why can't I do it? Why can't I do it? Why can't I do it? And then, then this is where, like, you know, Luke came in, he would fast forward it all, like, fast forward it, and I, so that's when I met the gym at 16 years old. This is when my life was, like, probably at my lowest. Like, I just played Xbox and in my room. Like, my dad, it would be like I was in a jail cell. My dad would give me my tray of food. I'd shut the door, eat the food, play Xbox, do that every single day from, say, like, at 9 a.m. till 7 p.m., 8 p.m., go to sleep, wake up at 5 a.m., switch the Xbox on, repeat, repeat, repeat. And then that's when my mum had a concern of, like, saying to Luke, you know, you have to do something with Tom here because, like, football's gone, there's nothing. And then this is when Luke took me to the gym. And, you know, a 16-year-old boy, I was like, oh, fuck. Like, this is there's never, like, he's massive. He's coming, oh, look, Tom, you have to come to the gym with me. Like, come on, huh? And him being, like, 26, 27 at the time, he knowing about the gym. But that was my worst take because I had, like, 
you know, going into the gym, seeing mirrors, seeing big guys, seeing girls, and I just thought every single person was staring at me. It's like I was in a big hole getting sucked outside my hood up. The only person I would talk to was Luke. When he went away on work, that was the hardest thing because I'm like, right, I'm getting into a routine. He's gone now. How am I meant to keep going? But then I just kept saying to myself, there's something in my head that said, don't quit. And for some reason, I didn't quit, so I just kept, like, Luke never pushed me, it was just like going slowly, 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 starting off slow, he was doing my diet, he was doing everything, and then we started building a relationship that we didn't really have, and like, you know, for all the gyms to me, it's kind of, it brought us closer as brothers, and that's the most powerful thing, because like, I didn't realise going to the gym would help me with my autism, would help me mentally, I didn't really, I didn't care about it physically, physically I was capable of, you know, within a year of the gym, I was, you know, improving so much, it was up here, I didn't realise that going to the gym to lift iron would help me talk to people, would help me open up and straw man, would help me tell people about my autism, would help me change it from a label to a superpower, so like, when I say like, the gym's changed my life, people go, oh, you're bonkers, you're just saying that, but like, it's, of it's, I'm I'm a blueprint of it saying my life. It's brought brothers that, you know, were never close because obviously Luke did his own thing. I had my struggles, autism. I no Luke didn't Luke was working and trying to do his life to then come together and have the best bond in the world, to then have a business together, to travel the world together, to do all these things. That's the only thing that I cared about was like, wow, Luke's actually took so much trust in me. And it was like a big fight, you know, like, you know, my mum obviously wanted me to be happy. Before she passed away, she wanted me to be happy, you know, and just straw man. She didn't say, say I don't care about straw man. I just want you to be happy. And that's, I think, the thing that, you know, she'll look down on now and, like, me and Luke are the best bond ever. And that's what autism does. Autism is so powerful. And when I put my mind to something, I realised that um, it's a superpower because I was waking up every single day tunnel visioned of what I wanted to do. And I was like, you know, you see these Superman and Batman on TV and they're like, Big, they're invincible, they don't care about anyone. I just got out of bed every single day. I didn't care about what anyone said. I didn't care. I had this goal. I was writing it down every single day and I was smashing life and I was so OCD. And I think, I think people without autism get distraction and get that. I just had this tunnel vision and that's why I was like, right, any kid that has autism can be whatever they want. And that's kind of how the gym has done so much to myself. Even doing this stuff, like, you know, when I was in school, these talks, I'd be in the class. I ain't doing no talks. Like you, I walked out of school. I didn't end up going to school. And then even strawman at the start couldn't do talks. But now, you know, YouTube channel. You, you, I did so much stuff to help me in front of cameras. And now I can't shut up. So it's you know, it's, <laughs> this is just it's just a bit of the story. But like, yeah, the gym, yeah, has saved me as an autistic kid, but also helped me get a better relationship with family and also find a wife and be able to live myself, have a business. So you know, it's an amazing thing to do and. When you put yourself so, when you put yourself in that vulnerable spot at sixteen years old, where I was like, right, I'll try it, but I don't think I'll ever do it. To then fast forward ten years later to where I am now, yeah, it's amazing what you know. I can give my, I give Luke credit, I give my family credit, but I also have to give myself credit because if I didn't keep doing stuff and try and doing stuff myself and trying to, you know, say to myself, you know, you can do it, then I wouldn't be here where I am. I wouldn't be here without Luke. Luke wouldn't be here without me. But we also wouldn't be here without ourselves as well. So. Mm. Quite an incredible story. I know it's one you've told mm. a few times, and I can see like you, you must still take it in and be like, t to get from where you were mm. in that situation to where you are now. And I, I say where you are as in just like a decent bloke, you know. And to get to that point, the rest is the cherry oh, on top. Sure. You know what I mean? The rest is like fucking Superman. <laughs> you know, when you actually think about it, yeah. because something was clearly there with the size, the genetics, all these different things. The stars have aligned. But especially now, like being a kid is tough. Being a parent's tough because kids are so different now, aren't they? Whether or not you know they have dyslexia or ADHD or autism or things that are perceived as not normal. Like I've got four kids. Like my lads, are like me, I can see. I don't want to put a label on him, but he wouldn't be under the normal bracket of sitting still. I suppose it just shows that there's two things. Like one, clearly, is exercise. We've spoken about that, but family and surrounding yourself with people that see the best in you. You know what I mean? See the best in you and could be able to drive that. And that's what I mean, the story of the two brothers that are the <laughs> strongest men in the world. You know, like, uh, do you ever sit back, Luke, and, and think, fuck? Oh, every day, man. You do? Yeah, every day. Like, that's why when I go to go for a swim, and it, it lets me reset and kind of be thankful for things, you know, because this isn't a, it's not a normal thing. You know, Tom, you know, we're a couple of little guys from Invergordon, the Highlands. You know, back when I was in school, it was like, you'd be... I don't know, 
accountant, engineer, work offshore, be a farmer. You know, there wasn't like, well, what about if I was to be a strong man and do a business and do it with my brother? Like there was never that <clears throat> that possibility. Um, so again, with, with Tom's story, it, it's so unique and so powerful that like a little boy born in the Highlands, in the middle of nowhere, basically, diagnosed with autism can then become one of the the biggest inspirations to, to so many people and I think that that's the you just said it there Jim as well it's like the the accolades the the trophies whatever that's that's really nice that's like the the icing on the cake the cherry on the top but the the substance the meat is is Tom as a person and hopefully me as a person as well mm -hmm. that we can hopefully you know when people come up the kids see Tom like people on the spectrum kids in the spectrum can see Tom and they look up to him and think, "Fucking hell! If if, if Tom can do it, Jesus, why, well, why can't I do that?" You know, it's and that that's the beauty I think behind it, and and that's being able to do it as brothers. You know, it's a lot. A lot of people kind of like, you know, oh, I I took Tom into the gym, whatever. But it was it was me that was needing Tom as well. I needed that like that support from from my brother. You know, it was. Um, Tom's one of the nicest guys in the world. When I used to go away offshore, when I used to travel abroad and stuff, Tom probably doesn't remember, you probably don't remember this, but whenever I landed, he said for me to phone him, can you phone me when you land? Uh, um, so I, I'd phone, I'd land whatever, like say I was working in Asia or whatever, hey Tom, that's me, just landed. He's like, oh, it was the flight, okay. I said, yeah, yeah, it's fine, it's all good, mate. I'll, I'll give you a message when I get to the hotel. So with, with Tom and his, his kind of, is autism or whatever it is, you know, it was it was a routine thing. So everything had to be regimented, routine, and that was a form of safety, I think, for you as well. So when you talk about the the train from Invergarden to Allness, which is about three or four miles, that was out of your routine, and that was like, oh, what's going to happen when I go on the train? It's not safe. It's not. Mum's not there. Mum, mum was your like safety blanket, and then you know, I think I probably took on the role of that safety blanket, but then likewise. I, I still I go into a gym and I get like you know you get that gym anxiety you know when you go to a, a new gym like oh, I don't like this but when I'm with Tom it's like we've got that mm. power we're, it's safety in numbers it's Tom's got that love for me I've got that love for Tom and like it's just nothing but like pride I think we feel for each other you know so that first time going back to World Strongest Man when Tom won that the first time. Like, I'd messed up my stone run. I could have finished the podium, but unfortunately, I'd, I'd slipped in the, the last second last stone and I kind of messed things up. So I could have had that moment. I was like, oh, self-pity, you know? And then I was like, oh, Jesus, Tom's going to be in there by himself with Brian Shaw with his guys. And I, I, as Tom says, I fucking pushed the fucking doors open. I was like, right, you wee fucking cunt. Fucking go, mate. Fuck them. You're the fucking strongest man in the world. They've got nothing on you. Absolutely, like Brian's guys were loud and shouting, but my voice is quite deep. Mm. So I was like, and Scottish, and Scottish, right. yeah. So that it's like scary. it's intimidating. And you can see Tom's eyes. He was like that little boy again, you know, that little kind of autistic boy from Regarden. Like, oh, fucking hell, Tom, come on! Like slapping him and like geeing him up. And then when he went out on that stage, I just kept just shouting at him, and and, and like that's the beauty of being brothers because you know how you react mm. to those type of situations. So Tom's done it to me before at World's Strongest Man, who's a Max Log. He doesn't need to do much to me. He just puts his hand on his shoulder and says, you know, you got this, it's fine. And that's it. I'm like, oh, that gets me in the in the feels. But then for Tom, it's that aggression and he gets it. And then, you know, Brian's a lovely guy, but he's got his, his, his rituals. He goes over each stone, blah, 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 takes his time. I'm like, fucking don't worry about him, Tom. Just fucking one job. You're the best. And like you're saying, do this for fucking mum. You're doing this for a mum. This is this is what you're here for. And then it was like phew, like a bloody orchestra, like boom, bra, 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 yeah, boom. Yeah. Wow. And then that was it. Looked round at Brian. And again, my favourite moment, if you can watch it back, it was like that like disbelief again it was like that moment when he went back to being that little boy from Invergarden with autism he didn't believe that that was like what happened and then he just became the greatest strong man on the planet and you know that's that's kind of through years of hard work but yeah it is that brotherhood it's that like that, that that safety that we have with each other because when we go to these places we have an energy like here we have an energy we have that connection we have we always have that was your friends, you know, you, 
your friends can piss you off or you can, you know, whatever. You're like, oh, Jesus, fucking just leave me alone and now, mate, it's fine. But with, with Tom and I, we can still annoy each other, but when we come together, mm. we've got that kind of, it's like a, a movable object, that movable force and... and like that's through everything. That's through Tom getting diagnosed with autism, me having to work offshore for seventeen years, mum dying, um, you know, Tom going through all his hardships growing up and, and supporting and being there and not being so caught up in yourself that you're not gonna give that that love and that help, that that kinda dedication to helping Tom and Tom helping me. Because as soon as Tom started going to the gym when he was sixteen, within I think 17 years, you were deadlifting 300 kilos. And I'm offshore. One year, not 17 years. By the time you were 17, oh, sorry, sorry, one year, sorry. I remember you were posting it, you posted it on Facebook, and I'm stuck in a, like a, a, a shithole of an oil rig in the North Sea on the top bank, and I'm looking on my phone or whatever it was on the computer. Like, Jesus, Tom's just done 300 kilos. That's insane. And that gave me a hope. You know, we talk about like a hope or a little bit of light at the end of the tunnel. Like, I don't, I don't want to work offshore till I was sixty-five. You know, that's not something. But that's what I thought I was going to have to do. Mm. But until Tom started to come along to the gym, he got me out of that dark place. You know, I was like struggling offshore. I was like mentally wasn't in a good place. But he, Tom, got me out of that place. You know, so um, I think that's a help with autism as well because, like. The only re- like Luke said, the only reason he quit is because I went on a month uh, long kind of incubator in Dubai with my wife. It was all paid for everything and training. Luke was offshore at this time. And, you know, for me, I think, like, that's why I said, I, I wanted to be a full time strong from like 21 years old, quit my jobs and just like stuff it. You know, I'm living once and don't care about money. I'm never going to be uh, getting as much money as Luke on a job. So I was just going to live my life and lift weights and. Yeah, I went out there to the month and he was offshore in an oil rig and he seen me do all this kind of stuff in Dubai and that and then that made him quit. You know, so it's like, I said, Luke saved me, I've saved him and then as soon as Luke quit his job, his his uh, career went from here to here and that's because, you know, full-time athlete, full-time results. You've gone all in. Yeah, yeah. part-time yeah. athlete, part-time results and I think he's seen me as like how rapid I progress in the sport, how I was like lifting weights just changes your life and like yeah that moment in Dubai I mean, Luke ended up coming out to Dubai and beating me and it was just like and as soon as that happened it was just like we both just went full time and bang and the results happened so you know like he didn't want to just stay offshore because he could have stayed offshore all, all his life and you know make really good money but he just realised it's like look at the opportunities Tom's getting at this you know and he quit his job and we both did it so you know we both like you said look, help each other support each other and Luke's been here for me, but yeah, I'd be here for him, and I think I helped him in that decision of getting offshore because it could have just been me that went full time, and he could have went part time and still had these like yeah decent results. But he would have never won Europe strongest man if he was still on the oil rigs. Mm. So that's kind of the you know power as well that like yeah he won Instagram story. Of, it was yeah, mad for honestly. Yeah. I remember being offshore. It was on the the Alba North platform. <laughs> that was a horrible job. Oh, it was like. Out of the North Sea. Out of the North Sea, yeah. It was like I was living out proper. Oh. It was brutal, man. <laughs> I'd just come back and I remember the job. I'd like crawl probably underneath like this table. And like being a big guy, it was like trying to get into different positions, measure pipes, check pipes and all the rest. And oh, I'm so tired. Went to the gym, had food, went back to the room at night, probably like half nine, ten o'clock at night. <laughs> on the bottom bank, like whoever it was in front, up, up in the top bank, snoring and farting. I'm like, oh god, my shoulders were overhanging in the bed. And then you go on Instagram, and Tom's out in Dubai Mall eating fancy food, <laughs> saying how everything's. I'm like, what the fuck? He's ten years younger than me, and I'm stuck off in an oil rig. So I messaged my wife, um, my wife Cushy, and said, look, I'm not going to go offshore anymore. This is me. I'm done. I, I can't do it. Like I don't want to be. You know, you get those guys in the bar like when you're 50 years old and like, oh, I could have done that, mm. son, when I was... And that's what I was going to be. I was going to be one of those guys. And, and again, it's not... You're not doing... Like, mum, you want to do her a good memory and a good justice and stuff. She sacrificed so much for us. And, you know, I think that's one of the reasons as well that, you know, we, we push ourselves so much is because, like, mum with her cancer, you know, we're very fortunate to be with her all the way through that and, and we got to say her goodbyes. But during that, that time... You also got to see her go through like immense pain and still battle on, still like, you know, three days before she passed away, 
she was making pear tarts, you know, like, I tell the story, like, you know, you've got the mixing bowl, she's cracking the eggs, putting the shell into the mixing bowl and putting the inside of the egg into the bin and mixing it. So I was like, Mum, come on, let's get a wee chat. And, but she was in agony, you know, her feet were swollen and she had to get, like, injections in her spine to stop her from going paralysed. And it, it was really tough. But seeing, like we say it, I know it's quite cliched and cheesy, but when you see someone go through that real pain, it, it makes you think, like, all we're doing is lifting weights. That's what Tom said at the start, like, that's why it is, it's all we're doing is lifting weights, that's not real pain, that's just like an in, like a, a, a second, it's, you know, we're putting ourselves in that position, mum didn't have that choice, and all the other people that are going through that, that's not their choice to be in that pain, and they still have to wake up, get on with it, get faced with that pain, we're just going through that superficial kind of, it's just lactic acid most mm. of the time, so it passes, and then we're okay again, we can come and sit, have a nice conversation, a lot of people don't have that. And that's what mum kind of taught us, I think, wasn't it? It's like to push our bodies to that, you know, higher higher pain threshold. And, um, yeah, hopefully it's it's kind of paid off. But it's been a, yeah, that Dubai thing, honestly, that was, uh, when I set the cruise, I was like, nah, I'm not doing this anymore. It's health, happiness and love before wealth. You know, like, I think, you know, I think Wim Hof said that, a few other people said that you can be a millionaire and stuff, but you can die at 50 year old and, mm. You know what you're gonna do with that money, but if you have health, happiness, and love, and live your whole life like that, it's a great life. And you know, I think you know that's kind of the thing that Luke, you know, Luke quit his job and probably got more healthier quitting his job, not being sure. You know, got more happy, and then you know the love was more bonded, and that's what that's what we always should live by. I think because you can chase money every single day, but you're always ever just chasing money. You're never chasing happiness, and you're never chasing what you want. You're just chasing that money because you think having loads of money, having loads of material things, is nice. But you know, man, you, you're not born with money. You don't die with money. So it's mm. what you do in your life's the best, and that's why, like, being an artist and having like, I watched Eddie Hall's documentary when you know he did that thing, and I was like, that's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna sacrifice everything. I don't care about money. It was like a week before Christmas. I texted. I went home, and she was like, "Why are you home?" I was like, uh, "I've quit my job." And she was like, "What the fuck?" It's one week before Christmas. I don't care. It's like money. Just leave it, and then I was just—I'm just doing this. I've—I've I've got one chance in my life to do this. I can go back to any single job in the world whenever I want to. That's why I did it. As I didn't chase money, I just wanted to chase, you know, happiness. I just wanted to make myself feel happy. I just wanted to chase love, and I just wanted to chase health. And that's kind of how I live for now. So, so. there we go. I would, if I was religious, I'd say amen. <laughs> but I feel you. You know, I know. Been through grief as well. It's actually two years today that my wife's mum died of cancer. Oh, the day before oh, my birthday, oh, and I watched her demise and the pain that she <laughs> was in. But then on the flip side of that, I saw. The power of love. Like I, I come from a very broken family, so not the same as her. But the mum, her mum, Anne, was the focal point of her family. You know, she wasn't the one that was going out to work. My wife's dad was the one going out to work. You know, they were doing what they were doing, not taking things for granted. Mm -hmm. But she was like the glue, and I saw the pain that they, they went through as a family, and then lose losing. You know the mum of the family, like it's a, a, t a tough, tough place to be in. And, and it is, it's part of life, isn't it? That's the sad thing is it's like that these aren't one off things. It's people are going through this. It's how you choose to then mm -hmm. deal with that grief and move forward and motivate yourself mm -hmm. in that space. So the way that you lads speak about it is, uh, is powerful. How, how's your wife? How is she? Is she coping okay? I guess it's yeah. a tough day today. We've got four kids. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, I, I imagine, I, I imagine, yeah, I, I, I say my, I don't have a huge amount of family, so mm. I, d I look at that and the love that they have. It's the the, the old uh, phrase: "It's better to have loved and lost than never loved at all." Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I look at that, and the pain that they went through was something that I've not yeah, seen. Yeah. And it's the longevity of a disease like cancer as well. You're literally watching someone's demise in front of you. Someone mm. that's so powerful. Someone that's birthed the people in that room there. It's, uh, it's tough, isn't it? It's, yeah, it's, yeah. Uh, but it's just a, it is unfortunately just a way of life now, though, isn't it? Mm. Like you say, it's it's just one of those things, and um, and but, getting out of them, you know, getting out of that situation, it's like listening to your story for a number of reasons, like the inspiration around that, mm. like it's fucking not easy, mm. like it's not an easy thing to do. As easy as it sounds, I'll just go to the gym, pick up a weight, or you know, go in something cold. That will make it all better. It isn't <laughs> that, is it? It's like the shift of the mind and the discipline and also talking about it and being able to say like this is a normal feeling these happen everywhere in the world like i'm with you like i feel you you know 
everyone's got a story, mm -hmm. haven't they? So, mm -hmm. um, sure. right, I was going to keep, we'll go positive and upbeat now. Yeah. Have you seen this power slap stuff they're doing in the oh, UFC? Geez. We, got, we got asked to do yeah. it as well. So. You got asked to do power slap? I said, no, nah, I'm no... <sighs> Tell me you fucking kill someone if you did that. I would get killed if someone did that to me. Jeez. Yeah. It's a bit match though, isn't it? It's just know. mental. You see their, like, they're normal. See their faces after three or four snaps, it laps it's their eyes. Was there, not, was there mm. one guy that couldn't feel, like, didn't have any pain tolerance, so he couldn't feel pain or something, so he, they could just keep hitting him, and that, it just got swollen, yeah. swollen, swollen. I think UFC have ruined themselves a little bit by having the power slap. Was this on so when, when you went to Abu Dhabi? No. It wasn't there at all? No. <laughs> I mean, it's not like you wouldn't call it a skill. No, you wouldn't call it a skill. I feel you feel bad almost saying that are they really athletes? Like, but he probably thinks he is. Let's have a look. Because <laughs> <Come on. laughs> you used to do it in school sometimes, then you're like, I can beat money now. <laughs> well, that's the functional <laughs> movement, isn't it? It's the rotation. Yes. Yeah, look, he's, he didn't look like an athlete, does he? Is that cotton? Wool yeah, you have years? to perforate. See, that's my nemesis. So after rugby, I need surgery in my eardrum because of getting like. So I've I've got half my eardrum missing. So I'd have to put cotton. Really? Well, I actually wouldn't because I wouldn't be able to pop it. Oh, shit. Hang on, someone's coming out to a bit of music. I mean, they got some sponsors. Look. How? But how do you? Um... Death Row, Origin. How do you become a professional slapper? Well, um, face slapper. Uh, yeah. <laughs> what are you? I'm a professional slapper. Yeah, I've been. <laughs> well, how big it's got for in uh, the. Do you think it's a volunteer? They just volunteer. They must get a bit of money. Oh, so, hang on, let's have a look at his, his weight. He's the oh, middleweight, so it is done on weight then. Okay. It's fierce. I mean, monster, monster, monster energy, monster. love it, don't they? Jeez, they it, don't care. Anything, no. <laughs> Just. And in the red corner, holding oh, a professional man. record of five wins, one loss. He's a champion. John Davis. Jeez. Weighing in at 184 pounds. So, I mean, the commercial uh, engine, Ohio. there's like betting companies involved in this. Rating. You can bet on this as well, eh? Jeez. That's mad. Right, let's get to some slapping. <laughs> By the way, this is like it's going to be. Oh, there right, we go. Jeez. Oh. These are middleweights. Tom, imagine, mate, and you, look, you'd be killing people here, even the heavyweights. We'll find out if there's big money in that, we'll get you in. <laughs> I'll, I'll volunteer Tom for that one. I wouldn't be able to reach Tom's head. Oof, it's just the way they have to line it up. That's just the scary part. Yeah. Isn't? Oh, that was shocking. Oh, no. oh, it's a foul. Clubbing. You know Michael Bisman's commentating. Is he? Yeah, he commentates on them. Oh, oh you can hear it, yeah. You can place, you can think about it. Oh, yeah. One point clubbing. Oh, so you hit him with the. Uh, right. right. Let's see if there's a knockout. <laughs> we'll have a look at one more. We'll watch this one and then we'll can it. Focus. Oh, yes. Yeah. Oh, that He's was nodding. Good. He knew that was good. That was He's nodding. <laughs> oh, gosh. Oh, my days. It's swollen already. One slap and his, his face is deformed. Oh, oh my God. gosh. Oh. 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 oh, my word. I'd the rather brain. box and do that. That's yeah. what I mean. You would. Like, yeah. at least. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Let's watch the return. Oh, jeez, man. We'll watch one of his the returns. The scary part is you have to put your hands behind your back. That's yeah, the that's the part. one. Uh, so you want to just, you have to hold the, that the club. Yeah. If you let go of it, then it's... Yeah, I think if you let go of it, you, you're out. That's the scary part, having you. He's, he's still dizzy, man, after that. Oh. You'd be shitting yourself, wouldn't you? Oh, oh. cheeky. Oh, come on, mate. 
Oh, he's got oh. him. Oh, no, no. no. Oh, let's see if there's a knockout, and then we'll get oh. off. Must be able oh. Having your face open and just letting them hit it. So power slap follow me on Instagram. Yeah. Which is, like, I think it's quite cool. Yeah. <laughs> Have they reached out to you to do a... I'm waiting, they might do now. Now we talk about it with you, lads. The, uh, big Tom and Big Jumps power slap. And... Oh, here we go. He's going to knock him out on this one. Oh, he's oh. gone. No. Jeez. <laughs> now, the Islander boys. They're made differently, aren't they? Let's just see if someone gets knocked out. Oh, oh yes. Well, watch this last one. I keep saying the last one. You're out. Oh, no. He's being dusted down. That's mental. Three slaps in his face is like... Oh, it's a slow mo. Jeez Louise. <laughs> Cut up and everything, eh? I've actually only looked at the highlights. I haven't watched a, a full... What do you call it? A fight? Oh, a slap off. <laughs> would you like, grow your nails really long? They must look at the nails, eh? Uh, right? ah, but you would... Be. A certain, uh, right, last one. He's got, there's a countdown. Look, this is round five. 20 seconds. 20 seconds. Imagine Mark Felix getting you across oh, the face. Eh? It's hard. So, oh. I mean, if there's money in this, maybe, Luke, as you age and you get into the 40s, if you're not as strong, fucking head to power slap. <laughs> I, I hope they're cool and they'll do better. <laughs> Just slap and run. Oh. Someone's going down there. Right on three. Oh, he's right on three. Oof, That's your major. He's going down here. Come on. Oh God. No, no, no. We'll leave it there. Oh, brutal. Um, but the UFC, obviously, Tom Aspinall. Won yeah, the, the fight, interim yeah. belt. I don't know if you saw that. He's yeah, I did, yeah. what an athlete. He's unbelievable. From a broken leg to his lowest in his career now, achieved his goal. Unbelievable. Shows, it? isn't it? Sp like sport. He's phenomenal. Yeah, but yeah. The, like you know, like we're big men. Yeah. He's, so I, he's the same weight as me. Well, believe it or not, I'm 118 kg. So he's probably your height, Luke. Right. 118 kgs. What an athlete. Yeah. yeah. Unreal. Right. Oof, yeah. What am I putting in? What's your greatest highlight? There's that one, the two twenty one Luke Stockman British I, log record. I do that one. That one. No, that's, yeah. that's a bit of All right. bit of hype. That was Sadrunas yeah, him as well. Right so. We need that clean to be as efficient as possible. So this is COVID, isn't it? Because there's people virtually on your own. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Is that better being on your own or not? Um, Head looking up. No, I prefer in a, in a competition environment. So this is two hundred twenty one kilos. Lift. There was a bit of a lag between big, the referee, big, big Z, and he was in Lithuania. <laughs> he was in the, the Wi-Fi is a bit out there. The Highland Wi-Fi. Clean's easy. And Scotsman hold the record. And what a lift there. Easy. Easy. Yes. Fuck. Get out of here pump that one. <laughs> so you've done there for the log lift. Uh. 200 and what's that? 21? 221. And what, what was the record? Um, before it was 220 kilos. So you've broke the record there? So the UK record, uh, the, the, so the, the world record is 230 kilos. Now. Yeah. Um, so it's just got, that just got broken two weeks, three weeks ago. Three, yeah, three could you do that or not? Yeah. It's only it's in nine kg. It's only it's not. Like a couple of bags of sugar. Yeah, it? exactly. It's nothing. Come on. Easy for the big boy, eh? Uh, yeah. Easy, mate. But yeah, um, I'll, hopefully next year when the shoulder is back to like 100%. Yeah, so when back. you do that, right, so if you've done 221 <coughs> there or you know it's 230, like surely at home you, you bang in, you, you're going to try at home a few times, right? So yeah, the most thing we, I did at home was 228.5. Oh, okay. Which was above the world record, about <coughs> half yeah. a kilo at the time. So again, it's kind of building confidence. That's a, it? That is a hard thing about world records because realistically you only get kind of one shot and that one shot could be the, the one. So you like when you mm. do like world record attempts, you never ever train the world record. Mm. So like, you know, when I was doing my Atlas Stone world record attempt it was at two eight six, I only trained to two sixty because you know when you do, when you're training at hundred percent your body could just collapse and you like you know, when I did the two eight six it w I did it once and it was the easiest I've ever done it. So you never ever not no strawman ever goes for the world record in the gym. Like it's just 
because, like I said, you know, you're exhorting yourself at 100. percent You've never done that weight before. You could do it in the gym. Your body could collapse. You could never get it ever again. Okay. And it's just, and it would just get harder and harder to build up again, build up again, really? build up again. Yeah. So it's almost like the stars need to align in that one moment. Yeah, I think so. It's. Um, I mean, everyone's different, but uh, most people don't do that anyway, do they? So like, yeah, I mean, it just depends. And sometimes if you're having a good day, you want to give it a little, do a little tickle. Do my yeah. Glasgow Stoner, so Tom Stopman Stone Stones. Run. Do yeah, that, that's cool. Do the Brian Shaw yeah, one. that's the year ago. Atlas Stones. Uh, that? The fourth one? At this one. Yeah, uh, winner takes it all. Let's have a look at this. Takes it all. This is my first year. World's oh, strongest yeah. man, the tune. This is it, man. Are you hot? Where's that one? I watched this one. This is uh, Sacramento. This was warm. Was it? Really, aye. About 40 degrees. I remember this one because this is where you were chanting as well. Aye. Big Brian Shaw, man. Good lad. Really nice boy. Is aye, it? Really good guy, yeah. Aye, he's class, he's a... Right. Look at the size of Tom. <laughs> the big curls in him, man. Tom Stoltman, but it's a hot day. Because for a tall man, this shouldn't work or not. This should, or this should is it work? It's easy because you have the higher up. Yeah, longer limbs and uh, a bit taller. Look at the speed of that, man. Fucking maniac. Brian's just on his fourth. Oh. Oh, he looks round. <laughs> so what was that? Was that the winning... That was, he knew he won it. Yeah, then. so yeah, I had to win that. Whoever won that stone ring would win World Strowers, man. So, so that was yeah. it, that was the moment. Yeah, yeah, so that last stone was 210 kilograms. So. Yeah. Such a cool arena as well. It's wild. With the Rogue as well, equipment. Do you a lot taller than Brian there, Tom? It's weird. Maybe that's that curls. Look at the size of the back. <laughs> Just a monster, man. Like that, to do that on that stage with that much pressure as well, that's oofed. And that's oofed. that feeling you were talking about, that euphoria. Boom. So is it heavier than the last stone? Yeah. Because it's shorter stall to put it on. No, they're all the st all the stones are the same height. Okay. It goes from like 120 to 210 at World Strollers, man. So it's like the heaviest stone run you'll do is at World, so. Oh, I might have a go. You've got 120 at home, haven't you? Yeah, easy, mate. Come easy, up. Yeah. I'll get, you, I'll get you repping 200 kg in a week. <laughs> We've got a 286 kilo stone as yeah. well. I'm all right straight up and down. I'll be honest, I deadlift. I do about 180 for five sets of A lot of people five. say that. Yeah, so, like, yeah, so, we got, yeah, so I did, the, uh, what look you seen there were looks at the ho at home record. I did my, two eight, so I did the world record stone at home, so it was 286 kilograms. <clears throat> <laughs> so it's a big stone and now I just use it as a seat because <laughs> it's not, it's, uh, it's so hard to train for. Like I said, a world record so hard to train for because because we're professional athletes and we train for five, six events, to try and specifically train for one event, it's imp it's so, so hard. That's why, like, you know, like, you'll see, like, some, like, Iron Bibby, for example, who's broken the world re log re re record twice in the last two years because that's all he focuses on. It. You have to focus on that, mm -hmm. like, 100%. Like, when we did the stone record, because it was covid Luke could focus on the log, I could focus on mm. the stone, and we got so strong with it. And uh, but yeah, if I if someone said to me do the two eight six stone in a, like three months, I probably wouldn't be able to do it because you're so focused on other things. World records are nice. I always think world records are nice, but they never ever kind of stamp your name in history because world records will always get broken eventually. Mm. And yeah, I just think it's titles are so much more valuable and prestigious than a world record. Yeah, it's like there's so much more going on, isn't there? It's like the complete athlete yeah. now, isn't yeah, it, when yeah, you're doing sure. all the different yeah, events. Yeah, I think it's so... You put your body so, through so much more, I think, for trying one red world record than you do training for a competition. Mm. <laughs> and for and if you win a competition, you get such much more prestige and much more kind of, mm. uh, you know, stuff off the back of it, whereas a world record, it's like, oh, I did a world record, Stone. Well done, you know. It, it's impressive, but it's never, like, that big thing, is yeah. it? So. Did you just say you did, what was your deadlift there? You <laughs> I've never, 180 five, kilogram. 180. For five yeah. fives? Tra well, that's trap bar. I probably don't, I probably do about 170. I, I'm, I, I sound, it's fucking embarrassing that's to say. Four points aside, that's decent. So, man. like now, because my body's wrecked, I do the <laughs> watt bike, I can do concept two rower, 
And then I'll do heavy weights. So I'll do like five sets of five on dumbbell bench, mm-hmm. 50 kg. Oh, I see you go. flip it. Then I'll do single arm row. <laughs> and then I'll do heavy trap bar. Oh, but nice. everything points to water, especially being tall, right? So yeah, as yeah. In, I'm not going to age well. Like you don't see yeah, yeah. 75, eight year old, six foot nine humans walking about, do you? Everything's about, you know, looking after yourself after. Mm-hmm. I listened to uh, Rogan and Hulk Hogan. Oh, I don't right. know if you saw the shape. I haven't on watched Hulk. that yet. Yeah, you should watch it. I mean, he's 70 odd. And because of what he's been through, all the injuries that he's had. Donnie and Yates so yeah you need to kind of look at, uh, that's the most important thing isn't it like look, Ronnie got like what surgery and a disc in his back he's like yeah buddy yeah. one week later yeah buddy I know. yeah so he loves the life but it's, it's just adapting, honest, adapting your training yeah. to your lifestyle isn't yeah. it yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah right lads before we go what's next give us what's on the horizon uh, so we're competing this weekend Giants Live uh, Team UK versus Team USA yeah. UK come on UK Ooh, ah. Liverpool yeah, yeah Liverpool so that'll be good and so the U- US are coming over the US all the right, big Yankees are coming oh, over. Strong, strong they? brush them aside. Eh? Yeah, yes. definitely strong smelling. So we'll know what's yeah. happening. Well, this will be out next week, so yeah. we'll see the outcome see of that. See what happens. Yeah. Who's favourites for that? Probably UK. Yeah, there yeah. you go. So it's an upset if you don't win. Uh, yeah, probably. I hope right. so. I mean, world's strongest man. Yeah, of course. <laughs> and no <his> pressure. <laughs> <laughs> and his brother. <laughs> so yeah, we've got that, and then just just trying to busy maybe a documentary coming out soon. Hopefully, maybe Netflix. or definitely, definitely. Yeah. So definitely. We, we've been filming for the last. Four years, I think. Um, so before Tom and I started winning things, um, we were filming with some guys. They were they followed us around. So it's like Joe Rogan saying, "Imagine your life of a documentary crew I've been mm. living it." So we've done it. Been doing that for the last Wicked. four years. And so Netflix have commissioned. They're that. speaking to Netflix at the moment. Yeah. yeah. So it's just trying to get everything sorted. Um, and then just next year, retain the title. Just keep on tra- the podium. Just keep training. We just keep training. Keep building a profile and just. Keep living a life. Eh? Keep going to that cold water, baby. Yeah, I'm That's gonna it. head up to the cold water really soon. I, I promise. May, maybe before, maybe before Christmas. We'll see. Anytime, if anytime. not after, yeah, lads. We'll it's been an absolute Thank you very much. pleasure, Thank genuinely. You. Like Thank getting you, you into the studio and chatting. I could I spoke to you for two more hours. So. Yeah, Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Cheers. Thank Cheers. you. And good luck over the next few weeks. Thank you, man.